All right, we're going live and it says we are live and we're two seconds in. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. So it's another, I haven't done one of these on solar and sustainability and we're doing introducing sustainability this time. Usually I just do solar um, and, and green energy, but today we got Chris Rohali, um, who's gonna talk about solar and then we got Chris Reinhardt with a K um, and we have a story about that, about how we're gonna differentiate the Chris's today. <laughs> Um, and so that's going to be fun. Um, we're going to share a lot of fun stories that Chris, um, I saw a post today. I, I have to bring this up. There was a picture on LinkedIn and, uh, it was a solar installation on a, a farm with goats and they were battling, um, micro cracks and they were trying to figure out how these cracks were going, getting into the solar panels. And then there was a, a shot and there was a goat and their, their paws are amazing because they were sitting on top of the panels at the, the top edge, right? They were just robbing around on it and breaking the glass. So, um, yeah. and, and, and you have stories about that too, right? Um, golf balls. We'll get into that story later. So stay tuned for the, the golf ball story. Um, you know, why golf balls were ending up in solar panels. You know, that's a good story too. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris, um, Chris with a K, Let's start off with, um, I want to document a little bit about your story and running and how that led you into kind of sustainability and interest in sustainability. Um, and then also kind of your name, like on Facebook and stuff, right? So yeah, let's let's start with you, Chris, with a K. Sure. Uh, so I got into running probably about 10, 15 years ago. And I, I, uh, I like to have fun when I run. And so about... Uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago, I started running. I would do my runs between um, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And whenever I was just out for a run, I'd throw on a Santa suit. So I just run on a, on a Santa suit. You know, you'd see the kids drive by, they'd love it. Um, and then when COVID hit, it, that was out of my designated time frame of when I, you know, you don't want to have Christmas all year round. Maybe some people do, but I said, you know what, COVID, people got to smile. Um, so as soon as we went into lockdown, I wore that for probably about a month. And so um, now in the running community, I'm often referred to as Christmas Reinhardt. Um, so that's been good. And then a few years ago, um, I started doing trail runs as opposed to just running on the sidewalk. And I've always been someone that was passionate about recycling and re reducing, reusing, you know, watching Captain Planet as a kid. Um and really with the Paris Agreement and everything, that really became more front and center for me. And I said, you know what? This is something I want to be involved in. I want to see how I can help and contribute. Um, and so I've gotten involved with the uh, Holland Climate Collaborative. And uh, our goal is to work with the city of Holland to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% each decade uh, through 2050. So wow. really, really exciting work with them. Yeah, wow. I, I'm, I'm writing notes because um, you told me all this stuff yesterday, but the the Santa suit story is brand new. And <laughs> so right before the show, we're like, we have to tell this story, right? So, um, and Chris Chris probably has some, the other Chris. So we'll, we'll call you Santa Chris. Is that, or do you that works. Christmas Santa, uh, Reinhardt? That's that's kind of a mouthful, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so we'll go. Um, so awesome stuff. I wrote some notes. We, we got to dig into some of that stuff a little bit more. Um, kind of your your initiatives and talk about your article too. You wrote um, yeah. an, op an editorial in, that got into the Holland Sentinel, and then um, it's got some really interesting content. Um, and I'll try to post a link to that um, the blog post. I think you have right awesome. um, in, in the notes below. Um, and so we're going to jump to Chris um, Rohali, and then in Flora, Indiana now, um, or or the office is there. Yep, and we also. I have, we have our first comment. So Chris, you may remember the McIntyres um, from Delphi, um, Lola and Russ, and they were ham radio yes. operators. Yes, and Lola is um, a piano, cheating piano now here in, in Holland, Michigan. Wow. And our new Camp 400 Boom Camp camper has solar panels on the roof with a phone app, seeking sunny campsites instead of shaded. <laughs> oh, and, and so, it's got solar panels on the roof. And I saw a video the other day of Russ with a big antenna um, out in the front yard. And uh, there was a pan of the cables going into the camper. And then we, we got a shot of Russ sitting in the camper operating his ham station. 
Um, and it's probably, I'm guessing it's powered by the solar panels on the roof. But that leads me into a second story, Chris, and maybe you can talk about this, is one of your vans um, in, at your solar panel, I believe, has panels on the top and an inverter inside. And I saw a little contraption to cook some food at, on, in the back of the van. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. What, we've, what we've done with uh, the project vans, and now we've got a uh, basically a, a rolling stock trailer that we park at, at larger jobs. So we always have like our, our mobile warehouse, if you will. <laughs> Um, but it's much more useful if we've got our own power. So we've we've got uh, on the, the van, we, uh, we kind of kind of limited in the van in that we had to, uh, instead of adding our own storage, we upsized the vehicle battery and we have uh, the solar through a charge controller um, that is is well, it's on whenever we're parked outside. And we've got a two kilowatt inverter in the in the back side of the van. So when we're not using it to charge up tool batteries or uh, power the winch to lift stuff to and from the roof, um, we can we can use it. Especially, and this comes in real handy on winter jobs uh, for a little microwave we have there. And in summer, the microwave gives way to a mini fridge so that we can keep beverages cool uh, until break time. But yeah, wow. we always want to have that, and uh, we don't always have the luxury of working somewhere where there is already power infrastructure. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, so so you're mobile, you're outside a lot of times. Um, another thing is consideration for the, the clients. You don't want to run cables out of their, their houses and use their energy. So you bring your own power plants on top of your van and and you feed your the people that work at the business. Uh, that's amazing. Um, and, and cool the drinks, which I was kind of curious about because that's that's kind of a high load, right? Um, cooling, the cooling systems and refrigeration. Um, oh, those little, those little systems only draw a few oh. amps. Um, oh, really? Okay. It's prob probably a 500 to 700 watt load, which yep, a, yep. a two kilowatt inverter can run handily. Wow. And, uh, so are you able to power the microwave and the fridge at the same time? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a challenge, just like a poorly wired kitchen in an older home. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a. Wow, so very cool, Chris. Um, so we'll we'll jump back to your your opening and kind of the questions that come up for your okay. business, um, which I think are very interesting. Um, we also had a so it's funny because we have two Chris's on the show today, and you know we have Santa Chris and and Chris Rohali, um, and now we have a confusion with. So I was talking about Russ McIntyre, who's a ham radio, and it sounds like Russell Fife is potentially could be a ham radio operator too. So there's confusion out in the world. Um, lots of Russes and Fife's and, and oh, sorry, Chris's um, today. Is there a Charles out there, Charlie or Charles? So, yeah. um, so, so um, Russ. So Russ has another love this space. How does solar handle surges of power? Um, so you know, if we could take that, um, maybe we'll lead into some questions, and then Santa Chris will come back to you to get more about your your article. So let's take this one um, since it's coming from the audience. And I think Russ, if you want to chime in, you know, I would love to get Russ on the call because I think he's working tangently in this space um, with with energy um, conservation. So, um, so Russ, we'll we'll chat on the side. But if Chris, so I'm getting all confused now. Chris or Holly with a C, if you could, how does solar handle surges of power? If you could address that. Um, I, there's, I'm I'm going to give a couple answers because uh, a power surge can come uh, from any of a number of directions. Uh, so first of all, let's just assume that we're talking about uh, demand. Ah, thank you. Thank you. So it's not it's not like an instantaneous electrical surge. You're talking about um, a surge in demand. So let's say, sure, I've got, let, let me just make nice even numbers that are easy to do math in one's head. Let's say I've got 10 kilowatts of solar installed and producing 10 kilowatts because um, we have a perfect, perfect frictionless day. And so I've got 10,000 watts in and suddenly uh, it is it is feeding uh, a, a set of loads that suddenly need 20 kilowatts for whatever reason. Um, I turn on a, a, a 10 kilowatt light bulb. Um, what happens, uh, first of all, it, I'm, I'm going to assume that this is a grid interactive system, which means the output of my inverter 
is in parallel with uh, or tied to the the utility feed to the building. And um, through the miracle of physics uh, and some creative designing of the inverters, the, the way electrically it works is that the uh, inverter output will be used by the local loads uh, first. And if there, if the loads, if the demand exceeds what the output from the inverter uh, can provide, uh, it just continues drawing and then uh, electrically the um, feed from the utility becomes just as viable. So it, it's just an additive parallel source and there's a real time blending of the two, um, both in surges in demand and uh, in the other direction in a, uh, a, a, an instantaneous drop in demand. What happens there is the converse, the excess part of what the inverter produces goes to feed the loads and the other part goes backward through the meter. So it's, uh, uh, you got to picture it, it flows pretty freely in all directions. It's, uh, is that, was that a fair it, way to answer that, you think, Charles? That's, it, it is, and it's, that's fascinating. Um, and, you know, I have a follow-up question, but I, I invited Russ um, Fife, not Russ McIntyre, to join the show. So he, he might jump on and ask you some follow-up questions. So you're talking about a um, a, a house or a, a commercial building that's connected to the grid. So so there's balancing. If there's excess, it goes there. If there's too much demand in the house, um, it all stays at the house, and then you pull from the grid. Have Correct. you installed any that aren't update or aren't connected to the grid? And what happens if your house demand exceeds the the power? Um, does it you know kind of shut everything down evenly? Or does can you set priorities on certain devices that get and then like your fridge yeah, shut so, or something? So that's fascinating. Um, it it it's very hardware dependent. So uh, the the systems that we have in place now we are are I, oh, let me just say past systems. Up until this point, it's it has been extremely tricky design because what you have to do is uh, go through every nightmare scenario. Um, of the, the all of the loads potentially being called for simultaneously, um, yeah. running simultaneously, I because mean, some loads actually have take a lot more power to turn on than they do to keep running. So when they're called for simultaneously, that is by far the worst case. Running simultaneously, a continuous current is uh, um, also pretty tough. Um, and so we, we look for surge maximum surge and maximum continuous output. And if, if it exceeds that, there's a breaker in the inverter, which will trip, uh, mm. which that that can be pretty unfortunate. Um, a, a residential sized battery inverter is about a 50 amp circuit. And remember that the main breaker in your typical home is 200. Mm. You can have 100, you can have 400, but typical is about, um, uh, a 200 amp service. So you've got to really be judicious with your loads. Now, yeah. uh, in just the recent past, um, we have available to us um, a smart uh, device that, um, and it works in an analog way. So I can apply this to any, even past systems that are installed. It works for your large loads like uh, your air conditioner, your uh, well pump, if you have one, your sump pump, any any 240 volt two pole load. I yeah. can put one of these devices in between the breaker and the actual device. And if it senses when well, the inverter output uh, is sagging, so if the demand is too high and the inverter tries to turn it all on, there'll yeah. be just an instant where that, that voltage will sag and the frequency will um, lose, uh, it'll go out of spec. These devices will shut off the big load only. They'll shut off their output. Okay. And then okay. I can have, I can have these scattered throughout the building and, um, they, they are sequenced in how they try to turn back on. So then they will with high priority first, come back in, try to turn on. And if that turns on, then the second priority will try to turn on. So there, there are a lot um, more sophisticated ways of doing that coming. Uh, 
um, this is probably the most accessible right now. Gotcha. Um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get right, Russ. Um, I think he's combing his hair or something. Uh, so, so what would happen, you know, the van would be a good example of a decentralized, you know, it's not connected to the grid. So what happens if you're trying to draw too much juice for that microwave than what's being put out? What Do you have like a brown out? Yes, exactly. Um, but um, what, let's see, what will typically happen is um, that when instead of a brownout, which a utility brownout, um, the utility doesn't go away. It's just, it's not able to supply enough power for all of the devices trying to pull it. Um, and so the devices kind of um, survive in this intermediate state where they're maybe on and maybe not all the way on. Um, okay. And it, that can be very harmful. Yeah. In, in a situation with the inverter, when, when you try to pull more power out of that inverter than it's designed for, it will to protect itself just trip a breaker and now you've got nothing so and, it won't be a brownout it'll be a blackout and when you're is flipping the breaker in an inverter similar to me flipping the inverter flipping the breaker in my house is it that simply i just go yep the difference is uh well no it's, it's it is the same so when you go to the inverter then and you reset the breaker if if everything is still on, it, it'll just trip again. Okay. So you'll you'll have to control your loads that way. It's pretty manual. Yeah. yeah. In so that, in I, that instance, we got another comment from Russ. Um, he he's trying to improve the way buildings draw power, power off the grid and reduce overall peak demand and usage. Um, here, so here. and then I think he's um, fiddling with the um, the link right now. Sometimes the Streamyard link lets you makes you try to log in and create an account. Um, no. Instead of just coming straight in, so so he's trying, he's trying to get on and post this question. So, um, so we're gonna pivot a little bit while we wait for Russ. Um, so he just joined. Oh, hey, Russ. Hey, Russ. So oh, I, I don't know, Chris, Russ, Chris. Have nice you guys you. has Chris, Chris with a K, Santa Chris. Have you met Russ before? I have not. Ah. Hey guys. Hey. Hi, Chris and Chris. Nice to meet you both. I'm in my co-working space right now. Uh, which is a part of my gym. So I actually was about to jump into a workout and uh, saw this broadcast come on. So um, I'm like, hey, I'll join in. I, and now I'm here, I guess. <laughs> a couple oh my of gosh. So, so Chris, in a row. <laughs> this is amazing. This is only the second time where I've gone on a live show and I just brought people in. The first time I did this, we had six people on the show. So I promise you guys, I'm not going to do that this time. <laughs> that gets a little crowded. Um, but, but Russ, you resonated with this cause you're in a parallel. So Russ, um, we met through a camp for entrepreneurs. Russ is a fellow entrepreneur of mine and he, um, he started a company. So C Santa Chris, do you mind if we <laughs> take another detour and let, um, Russ, so let's, let's go. Uh, yeah. Do you want to yeah. do a quick intro into, do you want to talk about ring cam a little bit and your journey through that? And Oh, sure. I'll give a quick synopsis on that. So yeah. A little intro about me. I'm uh, been in the startup game for quite a bit. I worked at um, Nextdoor Photos. I worked at uh, RingCam. Um, both incredible startups. Um, and RingCam was kind of my baby back when I graduated college. It was an engagement ring box with a camera inside of it to record your engagement proposals. Really give uh, more power to the guy when they tell that story uh, when they get on one knee, which kind of gets lost in the wedding shuffle, right? Um, and so learned a ton through that. I'd like to say that's my MBA experience there. <laughs> um, got uh, to learn how to go to market, connect with a bunch of jewelers and sell um, ring boxes, right? Uh, a lot of fun. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I got uh, connected to Nextdoor Photos. We launched real estate media photography companies. Um, I was one of their first hires there and grew it and scaled it 10x in three years. It was an incredible company. So, um, But now I'm on a new gig, uh, Key Energy Tech, which is my uh, latest and greatest startup here. It's um, uh, kind of what you were saying, Chris, and the questions I was asking, it was... Uh, about demand. So we, we help optimize building systems. We go in and we install technology. Uh, somebody gave a great quote that building commercial building systems nowadays are running off of 
like analog pneumatic controls, literally rolling, like back in the day we were rolling up windows automatically with those those rollers and you can still hear the clicks in your thermostat um, in commercial buildings. Um, and we're kind of going in and bringing it to the 21st century using technology that's actually being uh, implemented out in Texas right now. So we're kind of the first uh, group of people to bring it here to Michigan. Um, and why I asked about that peak demand is uh, what we're trying to do is save energy in both demand and usage by like a bunch of different strategies, whether that's managing occupancy. There's just so much waste in the commercial space because who's paying the bill? <laughs> I mean, it really kind of doesn't, uh, the pain isn't really there. Um, and so we've actually found a way to reduce energy usage, re reduce peak demand um, and energy companies will, no more like uh, power companies love it because they don't have to upgrade their grid because we do a bunch of automations to load roll, right, these buildings. Um, and, you know, uh, we work with ministries, nonprofits, and schools. And if you know anything about church on Sunday, they're kicking on the AC units at three, sometimes earlier in the day to just get the space up to temp. And so with our technology, we can do that without literally having these gigantic surges on Sunday morning, especially um, in Holland, Michigan, we got so many churches. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, Key Energy Tech, that's our startup, uh, automating building controls and, uh, you know, doing it in a really unique way, so. Wow, Russ, yeah. I, you know, I, I we had talked a little bit about it, but, you know, bringing Chris, Santa Chris, Chris Rohali, you onto this, I mean, this is incredible that the three of you <laughs> today got together because we're all in parallel efforts. So, so yeah. yes, stay, hold on for a second, because I want to bring Santa Chris in and talk mm -hmm. about what he wrote about in the article, because there's parallels in there and tangential, you know, paths. We can take this conversation with Chris's, Chris's article too. So Chris, do you want to take the floor for a little bit and, and give us kind of what, what you have done recently? Yeah. So recently I wrote an op-ed for the Holland Sentinel and the, I guess the thesis, the thought process is, you know, the Paris Agreement was signed in 2016. The global economy has shifted and the trajectory is set. You know, we can't change that. 195, 196 countries signed that agreement. And so we're rapidly marching towards uh, green energy and focus on renewable energy. And so this isn't something, you know, green energy, renewable energy, that's not something that should be politicized. That's something that we should simply embrace and move forward with. As you can see, more and more companies are coming out, you know, um, and they're saying that we want to be, you know, carbon zero, net zero. Um, and so now they're looking down to their suppliers and saying, we're going net zero, you need to be net zero because they're looking up their supply chain. And so from our perspective here in Holland, Michigan, as a financial advisor, you know, protecting our local economy, I want to keep those good paying jobs here. And so we need to make sure that our companies have access to renewable energy to keep those jobs here, attract future jobs. Um, so it, it's just something that I think we need to embrace and take seriously. You know, and as the U.S. has always been a leader in the global economy and arguably maybe we lost the 5G revolution here, as some people are saying, but we can't afford to lose this one. And it's something that we need to embrace, not just on a national level, but on a local level and really get to work on it. And so um, really excited. One of the things that, you know, I mentioned yesterday and something that's important to me is, you know, we get to a vote for elected officials every two, four or six years, but we vote every single day with the dollars we spend and the companies we support. So just about being cognizant of that. Yeah, no, that's that's very cool. And and we have local companies, Russ, you know, your company. And then Chris, you know, in, in Indiana area, we have companies that, that we can support and, and kind yeah. of cheer on like for like Chris's. Um, and, and I want to tack onto that and maybe we can have Chris tack onto the conversation here. But Chris, you talked about a parallel um, in, in Flora, Indiana, where there was some momentum um, it, and, you know, we can keep names of companies and, and people involved out of it. But I think you were 
um, sensing, you were seeing some momentum in you know request for demands and and clean energy, right? Even in right. in you know in Indiana in rural areas. Yeah, and it's it's fascinating because uh, so guys like Chris is a financial advisor, and um, uh, there there are people that make careers out of economic development because they believe in their communities and they want to uh, maintain that health of their communities uh, and see them grow. They like living where they live and they want to keep it up and raise the standard of living for all of uh, the members of the community. So we um, we moved into this facility last year and have been working on it pretty hard since then. We just now had our formal ribbon cutting. And so at, at the meeting with the economic development team here, it's this is Carroll County, Indiana, which um, that's an important point because Carroll County is, is a very um, uh, fruitful, no pun intended, agricultural area of Indiana. I mean, very, uh, it's great farmland, um, but there are a few um, small urban centers and companies are looking to locate in, you know, less densely populated areas with uh, more, um, more elbow room, more space. Uh, and yet he, he's telling me that they've had some inquiries from some very attractive larger national companies, but they're, they're requiring uh, that they uh, have access to 100% of their energy needs from renewable sources in order to locate facilities in our area, uh, which is, uh, that, that's really kind of inconsistent with um, the mindsets, uh, traditional mindsets of Indiana um, politically and economically, but I, I think everyone is coming around. Wow, that's you know, and I, I hadn't, I didn't know that, right? And I had heard that there was some some company, like European companies, that have headquarters or headquarters over there and have maybe you know divisional offices here. I've heard there's been some credits being applied and kind of you know being subsidized or promoting um, clean energy in the United States um, through that route. But you know, it's it's interesting to hear that you're seeing this out in rural communities now in indiana so i'm um, yeah. kind of the push um yeah that's fascinating stuff um so i, I do want to so you know and will I, hopefully we get to the story about squirrels and and solar panels <laughs> later in that um that is one of my stories so stay tuned for that if you're in the audience um how how squirrels can impact your solar panels um but but i want to step back to um, maybe Chris and Russ, you, you have some, some thoughts on this, but you know, the, I don't want to have any regrets, right? That's one of the things I, I will, I've thought about recently is, you know, when I get to, you know, 70, 80, I want to think back and it's like, man, I don't want to have any regrets. And I want to, you know, like Chris said, there's people moving in this direction. I was like, boy, I hope we catch up and we feed this effort. Um, and, so, you know, just, just kind of your comments on that is, you know, are you seeing, um, you know, the, it, it, you know, just tack onto this and maybe Russ, you can jump into this, you know, based on your business, are you seeing people look at more at efficiency and, and, you know, how are they shifting and pivoting into this area? Maybe we'll jump to Russ real quick. Oh, sure. Yeah. I just had a couple of questions. I, I mean, it seems like we have, you know, a solar guy and a financial guy I had a question about the two coming together because <laughs> I think with um, this space it's really high cost uh, to, at times to get into solar to get into even uh, projects like myself um, installing new thermostats or new equipment how are people addressing that how can we as a larger community address that issue with costs um, and some of that being like if you own a building, why invest in a solar panel when my renters are going to pay the utilities, right? How are we going to address those types of issues um, to really, I guess, like in a sustainability aspect, but also a financially sound one? So that's a lot of a lot of questions there, but I think it gets me going. <laughs> Russ, those are great because one of the themes of this show was to talk about the cost of solar, and you know, solar. I think the return. Um, you know, it could be 10 years out, it could be a long-term larger investment, right? So I think that's one of the, the thresholds that we're, um, you know, we're, we're running into right now. And Chris, maybe you can talk a little bit about costs because we talked yesterday about energy costs from utilities and there's kind of a three cent threshold. But when people talk about that number, 
they're not talking about the overall long-term investment. So um, I think this is a big one is, and I know Chris with Santa Chris, you talked about this yesterday is cost is a big one, um, you know, for, for everybody, right? You, you, people are, are worried about cost. And the other thing is in the Midwest, does it make sense? Everybody thinks of right. Southwest, you know, California, Texas, having a lot of sunshine doesn't make sense here. So, um, Chris, I know we discussed this. Do you, do you have some some input you can bring into? Um... Sure, sure. First of all, um, I'm, I'm going to say that the reason I'm available for this call today, Charles, and not, uh, you know, lounging at my waterfront high high rent district property is that I'm a horrible salesman um, for my stuff. And what, what I tell everyone up front is um, really... And this is even in our printed literature that we hand people when they're interested in buying solar, because usually they come to us when their bills are high. Um, we have some people motivated uh, just very academically at the environment. And then they're, if it's if it's an environmental focus that causes people to call me or some kind of corporate uh, um, uh, objective, then what they want to do is um, maximize the efficiency of their investment. But if it's someone calling me um it's typically after a cold winter or a cold snap in winter and they get their electric bill and they come out of their chairs and they say i want this bill to go away give me solar and we tell them you don't want to pay me before you do a whole bunch of other smart things that will pay off faster um which that gets into exactly what russ is saying uh, with building management and a holistic approach to energy and and what Chris is saying about you know don't don't just run into this without uh, giving very good thought to your ROI um, that being said the the economics of solar are driven by uh, two things one is the the cost of the power that you're replacing and that is a, a many, uh, variable equation depending where you are and and what rates the three of you might be in the same geographical location buying from the same utility company with three different rate schedules uh, and so your 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 personal economics for putting solar on would be completely different um, so that's that's one big thing the other thing that Chris you brought up yesterday was uh, about where are we um, is is the same investment in Holland, Michigan, going to pay off as quickly as uh, that investment in Flora, Indiana, uh, or as quickly as the same investment in Tucson, Arizona? So the, the, the answer is comparing either of our locations to Tucson, no, it won't pay off as fast. So then you have to ask yourself, well, what's an acceptable rate of return? If I can routinely show a 10% IRR, um, a lot of people find that that's acceptable, but if I'm talking to a um, a business owner, some, something that's more um, on beyond commercial toward industrial, they demand a two-year payback on any capital investment. So um, the 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 financial picture is really complicated. But I think that the one thing that uh, everyone on this call will agree on is solar ought to be a part of your equation. Uh, and it needs to be a well-rounded approach. Uh, and if you approach it like Chris does now from a mindset of uh, what about this business, this house? Uh, how, how is my best uh, big picture approach to making my lifestyle, my business lifestyle be sustainable? Um, and that's... Uh, I guarantee if I couple a solar investment with a lighting upgrade, uh, adding insulation, putting in some sophisticated building controls for occupancy and um, the project as a whole usually pencils very well. Interesting. Yeah, yeah so Chris, Chris, um, it, I, I, a lot of stuff going through my head in that. So let me just try to summarize. So there's, different costs and different rates, even in the same geographic location, number one, from, from your utility. So you take that into consideration. I think what you said too is it's interesting in that a lot of people that do ROI calculations, um, especially the industrial commercial side, look at two years. So selling to industrial, um, you know, 
companies, basically, solar solutions, it's a longer term payback. So that's a, a more difficult sell. Um, and then a lot of times people are coming to you um, after they've been hit hard by you know a, a cold winter or something and the bills go up. So then they look at that. And I think coupled with Chris's and Russ's solutions, um, uh, there's many, many things that could um, come into it um, where solution could be one option in the whole package of things that you could use to improve the efficiency of your home. Is that kind of the summary of? That's, okay. that's wow. Awesome. The other, the other piece of context that we try to share with people, Charles, is that, um, so especially, I mean, take that ener the energy that you felt when you opened up your, your ridiculous uh, power bills in the winter yeah. and realize that, uh, yeah, your return might be, uh, you won't get a Tesla stock uh, caliber return or a Bitcoin caliber of return with solar. However, um, the cost of doing nothing with your money means that you will forever be getting a zero rate of return uh, for for every penny that you write a check for with your monthly utility bill. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's Fascinating. That's money that's not paying off. Yeah. Very cool, Chris. Um, and then we have Santa Chris has a question for us, I think. so. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's always the, you know, hard costs that go into this. But then I think about our friends in Texas and they were all attached to the Texas grid, which I just found out this year, there's three power grids in the U S the East coast, the West coast in Texas. Um, and if you are having your own power source, such as solar, I mean, there's, there's gotta be some intangible benefits where maybe I can't bring the whole workforce in, but maybe if I have a, so much solar power, I could bring in, you know, I could, and we lose power in the area. I can just bring in part of my crew to keep operations going. Is that something that would be a benefit from solar where you're quasi decentralized from the grid? Yeah, actually yeah. there's, there's some really cool stuff going on there, Chris. Um, so there are a couple of, um, well, there's a lot of development going on in what's called a virtual power plant. And what that is, is let's say um, we're, I actually have a meeting next week with uh, a, a local utility to talk about this very thing. Let's say that they have um, a, a pretty far flung infrastructure, which they do. And, and um, you know, there are pockets of what, what, what they see is there, there are pockets. You, you have one leg out to one part of the county and there's a bunch of houses and farms out there. And then another leg goes into um, the center of town and there's just typical uh, uh, urban kind of usage profiles. And so they have all of these legs of distribution and management of the grid is, is a pretty complicated task and it's getting harder. What they're finding is that let's say in Charles in your subdivision, which is kind of out in the open because you like countryside and big lots, uh, you buy an electric vehicle and your neighbor walks over when you bring it in and say, you know, I've been thinking about this, doggone it, I'm, I'm going to do it because yours looks awesome. And from before you know it, there's two electric vehicles. And then the people from down the block walk by, they are seeing EV adoption happen in clusters because of this dynamic. So now they've got imbalance in their grid because they have all these people in one tiny spot who charge up EVs. Um, and that's that's not how they kind of have structured their load in the past. And, and they're gonna need to do something to shift things around to support it and keep it stable. Um, one uh, potential being developed and actively promoted by a, a couple of solar manufacturers is this virtual power plant, which is, all right, Charles, why don't you then also invest in generating some of your own solar so that you can maybe not have to buy any power to charge your vehicle. Um, and if you then have some battery storage with that solar and your neighbor does and his neighbor does, and you're all grid connected and internet connected, then I could be running a central uh, control software here uh, as, as a representative of the utility. And they can say, oh, you know what? We're seeing a surge in that part of the grid um, because of my agreement with Charles, Chris and Russ, I'm going to actually draw from their batteries 
and use their inverters to power uh, that, that little extra bump onto the grid that I need to get through this spike. Um, and so uh, it's, it's considered like a mesh network of inverters and batteries instead of a centralized um, uh, thousand acre solar field with a couple of rail cars and batteries. That's it's fascinating what's becoming available. Wow. So Chris and then and Santa Chris, um, didn't Holland just buy, is it Tesla's for, for the city or I know one of, one of the police cars is a yeah. Tesla. Oh my gosh. So we're going to get, um, a bunch of surges as people buy, you know, if, if that car has a certain loop, are we going to see like a loop surge around the city and you can map <laughs> this on my, one of my power BI reports. Right. So, uh, <laughs> So Russ, let us know if you have any questions. Chris is, uh, Santa Chris has been typing them in, but but you have another Chris question, right, Santa Chris? So we'll we'll yeah. go with that. Yeah. So if if I if someone installs solar panels, are they then able to sell renewable energy credits to try to recoup some of that cost? Yeah. The, or does it have to have enough power for that? Yeah. No. Yeah. You, there are aggregators. You can have a, a very small system and um sign up with this aggregation service there are a few of them but what what an srec is is a solar renewable energy credit uh and uh, in in the case of uh, renewable energy solar and wind both the, the one credit is um earned from a a registered facility it whenever it produces uh 1000 kilowatt hours so produces 1,000 kilowatt hours, you get you get a, a a credit. It's they used to call them tickets. Um, and so the bigger the facility, the more of those you generate. Uh, my very small solar array on my house, personally, I'll maybe generate six to eight per year. But through this aggregation service, they can go to whatever markets I might be eligible for, and mm. uh, aggregate them into blocks and sell them. The problem is that the the SREC market is is largely driven by um, the voluntary state policies that that uh, they they have early in, in the in the teens shortly after 2010 there was a, a very um, vibrant SREC market as states were implementing what they called renewable portfolio standards. And that was a requirement at state level for energy in the state to have a certain percentage generated from renewable sources that increased every year. And if utilities were not keeping pace with the increase, they could buy credits for the increased production at an auction. And so these blocks of credits from systems all over that were eligible could then be auctioned off and purchased by the utility so that they didn't have to, um, they had time to plan and invest uh, and, and do something smart. But in, in between time, they could buy credits, which kind of funded um, and incentivized people to install more, right? To generate more capacity. Wow. Yeah. yeah I didn't even know what Rex were before this. So, <laughs> it's, so and it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. It's, um, I shouldn't say problem. Um, what happens is so in indiana and michigan i believe the most likely place and maybe the only place uh, that you can sell an srec would be into the ohio market because their uh, standard was written so that half of the credits had to be purchased from energy generated inside ohio and the other half from any contiguous state um, but then they uh, a few years into that, they changed their standard and removed the requirement to increase. Um, and at the same time, the ring states uh, implemented a lot of energy production. And so while there are still are SREX, they're, they're pretty, pretty low value to the point of being uh, really, really hard to justify your time right now. Um, but I would love I would love to see that replaced with something that truly uh, put some equivalency to the the carbon benefit because that's really what this is all about. Yeah, cool. Oh, very interesting, Chris. Um, I I do want to throw Russ right. Sure. Up. 
here. Um, because you, you've been a little quiet. Um, so I'm gonna put you on the hot seat. <laughs> Let's go. All right. So, um, you know, and and so if you have any any questions for either of these guys or any you know good stories about your your business and what you're discovering, right, in the efficiency world. Um, and then, or if you want to go into the ring, which I think is, a, there's a good story you have, and this is not solar related, but it's kind of entrepreneurial. Um, when you sold the ring cam, you thought you were just, um, capturing moments and, but you ended up being, um, a teacher in a way to teach people about videography, right? So, so that's an interesting story. So if you want to tell that, or if you want to talk yeah. about the efficiency stuff, that'd be good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can talk about ring cam uh, definitely all day, right? But I have some. Uh, <laughs> I, my question, I guess, is uh, first. So, solar. I think there's this middle path, right? We're kind of changing. The direction is shifting globally, um, right? To uh, be more energy efficient, be more sustainable. And I guess I'm trying to figure out this baby step, right? Solar seems to be this high cost, at least it's been known to be a high cost investment. And I think we're coming up with great creative solutions to lessen that cost. Um, uh, like the governments are creating funds, incentives, no, like 0% financing. Um, utility companies are buying down those loans, which is incredible. Um, at least here in Michigan, you can get like energy credits or get 0% financing on some of these projects. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out, I've only been in this space for about a year, by the way. So <laughs> I'm very new to it, but I am trying to figure out the baby step. Like what's the in-between? How can we get somebody to start thinking, changing the culture in a way to be more energy efficient? Um, and I, I guess I'm thinking my system helps bring that to reality, right? We try to lower utility bills by 20% because that's about how much people are heating and cooling rooms that don't need to be heated and cooled or they're overheating and cooling them um, because of the way they're programmed, right? Um, so I'm trying to figure out ways to get people to think that way, but also finance and build a budget or a, a stream of revenue to fund those solar initiatives, to fund battery solutions to offset those peak hours in those rates, right? Because some of these rates are off peak and high peak hours. Um, do you think there needs to be more? And, and really, how do you justify coming into this space as a startup like myself? It's really hard to get into the sustainability space um, when it's just so, I guess, like really high investment. What would you give maybe some tips and advice for me <laughs> as a startup in this space too? Okay. So I, th I think um, it, maybe we'll go Santa Cruz. Can we, because you are part of a group <laughs> in town, right? That that promotes sustainability. So I think you would have some great insights um, into maybe baby steps that you've thought about for you know the city or the area, West Michigan. So what are your thoughts on this, on how do we get people to adopt it maybe in smaller increments to get them to, you know, the larger ideas. So like previous to being a, a financial advisor, I used to work with businesses on cash flow. And so, you know, when you think about, you know, some of those smaller investments, like a really small investment you can make is, you know, like those light switches that are motion detector, right? So you leave the room, it turns off, right? So if you can go and you can find numerous ones of those, you know, like, like Chris said, you know, more insulation. So if you can say, hey, listen, we're gonna cut these bills using these very small marginal methods, low cost investment, easy payback. We're gonna cut your bills 20%. We're gonna take the cash flow from that 20% savings and we're gonna use that to fund these greater things. And walk with me down this path for five years and it's, we're gonna take what it was once this big cash flow, we're gonna give you assets. And then the cost will drop precipitously once it's we've returned that capital from the initial investment. So I think you just got to, you know, it's like rolling a snowball down a mountain, right? It just keeps building on itself, building on itself. Um, and then, you know, you're off and running. So I know the city of Holland has, you know, a retrofit program. So, you know, even, you know, some, some of these companies have like a break room with a dishwasher in it from like, you know, 1970. You replace that thing with a modern dishwasher, you're saving water, you're saving power. 
Um, I think there's a thousand little things that you can do to build up, to generate the cash flow for the big meaningful ones. Um, but Chris, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah ex exactly what you just said, Chris. That's that that's brilliance. Um, because we we start with the advice uh, since we still have the luxury of um, a tax credit for our our product. So our customers all qualify for a tax credit. We try to uh, to get people to think end game. We try to get them to invest in uh, efficiency improvements first, but once they've come to us, hopefully after they've saved some money from efficiency upgrades, uh, if, if they have an end game in mind uh, that we can design in phases, uh, then they can put in phase one, which is a less um, of, of a, a cold slap in the face uh, financially. Uh, but then but then next tax year, they have uh, uh, not only the, the cash flow from the avoided cost that you just described, Chris, but then they also add that to a tax credit. It's like, all right, now you've got a, a bigger seed money for phase two that increases your cash flow savings and um, it, it generates a second tax credit. So, I, uh, so you can you can divide that up into a few bites uh, and and make it manageable. Wow, very cool. Um, so. Thank, cool. Thanks, Chris and Santa Chris. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're we're at 51 minutes. Um, I, I warned everybody yesterday that uh, Chris and Santa Chris, this yeah. these things go and then they take a mind of their own and the life of their own and they go off. So um, we're going to start kind of winding down, um, interestingly. <laughs> so it seems like we're just getting started. So I probably need to invite this group back for another round. Um, but Chris, so one of the topics I want to end on, on maybe we'll do a round table on the one thing we want everybody in the audience to take out of this conversation from your standpoint today. Um, but Chris, I do want to approach um, another common question that comes up with people that have installed systems. One of the questions is inverters are one of um, the failure points, the more common failure points. And I've learned from you and and you know, several others in the industry that it's they're they're complex. It's not like they're they're um, a simple passive device. They're they're actually doing a lot in terms of inverting the the signal and turning it into a wave, right? So, um, so maybe you can do a quick um, summary of of what inverters are and maybe some you know the types of inverters and why you know people need to be aware of this um, before they go into this investment. Sure, sure. Um... Yeah, the inverter has two jobs. And uh, job one is um, a uh, Charles. Can I use jargon? I don't want to use jargon, but it's uh, so for techies. It, it, it's DC to DC conversion. So the front end of an inverter is all about trying to manipulate the input voltage from the panels up into the range where the business end of the inverter uh, that does the conversion DC to AC it it has a sweet spot. And so the front end is all about moving that DC voltage so that it stays in the sweet spot and you don't lose energy and heat you, the, in the conversion process, that it, it can convert to AC as efficiently as possible. Um, so the, the three different architecture families, if you will, of inverters, um, uh, the inverter encompasses both of those uh, in a microinverter or a string inverter. And it separates them out into two physical pieces in what um, I call a, a, uh, an optimized inverter. So the optimized inverter takes the DC conversion and puts it into an optimizer, a DC optimizer, and puts one of those at each panel uh, and then feeds the combined signal over to the inverter that converts it to AC. Um, the others, a microinverter is like the whole inverter job at each panel and it sends a uh, power output as ac from the panel or from just under the panel um, and a string inverter uh, adds uh, if you've done your design right you you add the, the panels in series and you have a higher dc voltage as the input to the string inverter and then it does the powerpoint tracking and the conversion uh, all, all in the one box 
Wow. So it, now there's, it makes there's sense. There's a lot of electronics in there. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like you said, Charles, there's a lot of inverters, a lot of uh, electronics in there. And we think nothing of sophisticated electronics in our pocket, knowing that, you know, if, if we get three years out of this thing, um, we're really thrilled. Um, and inverter lives are, um, you know, any commercial project or industrial project, when you put together the cash flow, the 25 to 30 year life cash flow, at year 15, you put in a chunk of money to replace inverters. Um, that's that's just what you do. If you if the inverter lives beyond that, then the project does better financially. But you have to assume going in, you're going to need to replace those. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, and that's a you know it's a question I don't think people ask a lot of times. Um, but it happens once you've installed it, you're like, why are these failing before the panels? They're supposed to last 20 years. So so I, I thank you for addressing that um, and explaining it. You know, even though there was jargon, it helped with the complexity of what an inverter does and all the different um, pieces of it. And we're going to, in the link, I'll, I'll post the, you, you made a kind of a cheat sheet to explain all the different types of inverters. Um, so we're going to post that there. And then I think yesterday you were going to update that too. So I'll post the, the current version um, and then we'll jump in. Um, I'll provide the, the updated version too. Um, so I forget, what were we going to update about the inverters? Uh, we were going to say that uh, not all inverters give you a panel by panel monitoring capability. Oh, that's right. Because, yeah, I've, I've heard some will. So if you have a panel failing, you can look at this dashboard and they'll report that this is the panel that's failing. And that's the other issue and um, that you had talked about is, and, and I'll just do a quick summary, is you have, you know, with, with a, an inverter that monitors the whole array, you can't tell if one array it has failed or which one where the problem is occurring, right? So so with a micro inverter, potentially you could single out if it reports back, but um, you've, you've invented something and maybe we just go into that real quick. Um, you have a quick story you can tell about a device, and this goes into the squirrel story too. So, oh yeah, yeah, we we had a a, a small system on a, a just a, a horrible, very high, very steep roof that just a few months after we put it in stopped working for reasons unknown to us. It blew a fuse inside the inverter, which is really unusual for that fuse to blow. And when we when we finally did all the troubleshooting back up to it. Um, we, we lifted a couple of panels on the very peak of the roof and found that squirrels had chewed through wires, um, underneath the panels. So it's like, yeah, uh, we've, we've known that rodents like to chew on, on wire insulation, but, uh, so yeah, we're going to have to do something to keep his neighbors out of his roof. And, and do you want to kind of quickly summarize the solution you have to inspect the panels? Oh, you know, probably another thing, uh, another another day for more detail, but we do have a low profile remote control robot with uh, thermal and uh, video cameras that I can run up and down, depending if my mounting system gives me roof clearance that's sufficient. Um, I can go under there and look at every wire connection from the ground. Yeah. So Russ, you may be interested in that because you were in the vision ring cam industry back in the day. Yeah. So, really so yeah. Um, so Russ, um, so we'll go into closing comments. Um, you know, what is the one thing you want the audience to know about your, your company or about sustainability or about, you know, this, this area in general from, from today's conversation? Yeah. Um, I think it's really important now that we're kind of moving towards an energy efficient, sustainable world, um, that there is a way to reduce your energy bills. I think that's the one line item that people kind of throw into the wind. Um, and there's uh, people like myself, my company, um, who are trying to solve that problem uh, to commercial buildings, right? So we're looking at commercial size building owners that are 50,000 square feet or more. Um, and we're trying to bring their control systems, their behaviors, their culture to the modern age. Um, so that one day when solar becomes a requirement, you'll have the funds and the building controls, more or less, uh, that best works with those types of systems. Um, so yeah, don't just throw your uh, utility bill money into the 
you know, into the wind, consider that there are ways to reduce it, no matter how big or small um, the building that you own is. Um, I think that's a big takeaway. And there are tons of people in this space, whether that's tax credit, um, rebates from utility companies, programs from um, Holland BPW, even for your own home. There's just so many ways that you can reduce your energy bills right now. Um, and now is as good as ever to take that first step. So cool. Um, yeah. So thanks. Thanks so much, Russ. And then, you know, what's interesting is maybe we can talk about the data you're gathering from your initiatives, right? What are the, you know, the, the technologies you said, there's some old um, antiquated systems used to automate some of this stuff. So, you, you know, you're looking at ways to improve that. Um, you know, so what types of systems are being used or what are the largest loads as you go through these studies, you know, what is, where is the energy consumption coming from as you study? Because you're going to have this unique data set. And you know oh, me, yeah. being the Power BI guy, I want to chart all this. So, <laughs> Charles, do I have data? I, I mean, the first step we do is this utility analysis. We take yeah. two years of utility bills across all these different buildings. And when you have a school that owns 10 buildings, that's a lot of utility bills to go through. But that right. data is so powerful. And Charles, I think you'd geek out about it because you'll see spikes where the sprinkler broke. You'll see times when like they ran their computers for a week without shutting them down. And it's just obvious. Um, oh my gosh. It's so, crazy. So. I'm going to give you a call about 10 minutes after this call. We'll <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. So, um, and then, so we have uh, Richard Campbell. Um, he says, so there's, there's dashboard. Oh, this must be, um, he's got, um, He's, I his think he, he's, in, yeah, his system. And I think Solar Edge yep. reports it up and you can log in under your profile. You can create a login and then watch your, your system um, on the roof. So um, yeah, and Richard has been, he's been going back and forth with me. He's installed a system and he's got a presentation. I think he goes around town telling people about his system. So he's, he's really proud of it. Um, boy, we should have had Richard on the call too. Next time, next time we're gonna have Richard. Um, on the, on the call with us. So, um, and then, so let's go. Um, so Chris, Santa Chris. Yeah. Uh, let's go with, with your thoughts on what you want the audience to take out of this today. Yeah. So public, you know, companies previously weren't releasing data on their sustainability, uh, their commitment to renewable energy. That information is now becoming more and more widely available. So, you know, I, I would just go back to what I stated earlier and that is, you know, you can vote every day with the dollar you spend. Be aware of what companies you're spending with, who you're supporting, um, and just be very cognizant of that. I think that's that's the one thing that I would recommend for everyone. And that's it costs nothing to do. Yeah, I mean, that's investment. That is that's you know, and I've been thinking about this. Um, I thought I've been teaching the kids about money, right? It's it's a store of value and it's a piece of paper. And I yeah. pull them about Pokemon cards. It's like it's a store of value. So I told him, I was like, you know, what, what does that value mean to you? What did you exchange for it? You know, and I thought about it in terms of their, their future, right? For me, yeah. I want to invest in, in businesses that are taking care of their future. So to me, I would invest in a company that is doing stuff that is sustainable because that's an investment in their future. So I, I think of money, yeah, in, a, in kind of a strange way, because it's not um, always rate of return for me because there's all these intangible um you know value that's stored inside the money and it's it's kind of personal it doesn't have to be actual what's written on that piece of paper it could be you know the value of my children's future um the sustainability so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it ties into what i'm i'm teaching the kids right now and i'm telling yeah. them about it isn't it interesting like this pokemon card you know what's it worth to you and yeah. You know, this one card is like, my, my son's like, well, that's a very rare thousand dollar card. I was like, yeah, but to me, as your dad, this is a piece of cardboard. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You're like, so I, I can get you to clean your room in the bathroom 10 times for this car. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the, that's the transfer of value to him. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so fascinating that, you know, money is a store of value and it means we all have to agree. And if there are certain groups that don't agree, then that, that piece of stored value has no value. Yeah. Exactly. So, fascinating stuff. So, yeah. um, wow, we are um, 104 in terms of time. So, Chris, 
Um, what what are your um, parting thoughts for the audience today? Um, thank you for attending yeah. from Flora. Yeah. But um, You're welcome. yeah. So my parting thoughts are uh, um, the, the, what a what a great combination of of skill sets and expertise here. Um, what I urge people to do, if you see this and you're really um, frustrated with spending those dollars where you don't want them, um, especially after your cold February bills, um, if and if you really don't have a very good intuitive sense of how you're using your power, either as a homeowner or a business, you might consider, um, first of all, talk to a guy like Chris uh, who understands the finances because there are some bad actors. There's some sharks in the water if there's money to be had. Um, and you might consider putting up a system um, uh, solar just like your, uh, your, your last commenter has something that gives you a lot of visibility into the data because um, day in, day out, we run into people and businesses who that just really have trouble uh, wrapping their minds around the concept of what action on their part consumes energy and therefore drives cost. So it's only once you can see into the system and, and actually see some of the data. Power BI, Charles. I mean, the, the, that's you're all about putting visual um, manifestation of data, right? And so, yeah. having having a small solar system with uh, plenty of monitoring and maybe even some consumption monitoring will finally let you see where you go. Then, when you go and put in Russ's total building management system, you can see how the consumption drops and where it drops and when. And, and how much better uh, the, the system does for you, the array. Uh, so it, again, this is, it, it's not, um, you, you can't go in with one bullet in the chamber. Um, you you, you kind of need a, a whole pile of tools and you need to approach it with some financial savvy. Wow, Chris, you know, thank you so much for those thoughts. And that just brings up um, my parting story is um, I talked to some people at Big Dutchman and they installed solar panels on top of their building. And the lesson they learned there was they had never really thought about and monitored their usage before. And I think right. it was, right. um, you know, that the lighting was the, you know, then they had a baseline. So once they had the baseline, they could monitor their usage and they could see, I, I believe it was their lights when the lights, the big overhead lights, was consuming a lot of uh, power. And when they turned those off after first shift, um, they saw the drop. And then, you know, when they went to third shift, they saw that it kicked back on. Yeah. And that reminds me of the, I forget who who talked about the AC, you know, at, at churches, when you were <laughs> warming yeah, up, you're going to see that kick yeah. on and you're like, I, there's nobody in the building, but you're <laughs> using all this energy. So, yeah. you know, then, then people start correlating with usage and the demand and what what that means and what is going to waste and what is really being utilized for you know the yeah. comfort of people in the building so i think that's that's huge in terms of you know the data um you will get a baseline and then you bring in somebody like russ and then you will see you know that the, the fluctuate or the investments you know i'm investing in this and here's where um it's reducing the energy usage um so Let's not talk about KVAR for industrial being a huge part of their consumption. Um, oh, so I, yeah, yep. Jason, that, that, that's, a, that's yep. a whole nother great conversation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, so, so we'll, we'll save that, Jason. Um, it, it, do you know Jason? Is he from Indiana? Or? Yes. Okay. Yep. So maybe we can bring him on the next show. I, I, I think this could keep going here because we're getting all kinds of comments. So Richard, um, the next one to get a realtor's perspective of residential solar and how it affects equity and resale. Ooh, Rust, you probably from your next door photo days may have some connections to help us on the next show, potentially, sure. right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I know that's a growing market, at least in California, Oregon. They literally are putting in their um, MLSs, like yeah. solar, how much they're saving their solar credit, it's like required now. Um, and so I was a part of the team that was responsible for like making sure that the right data was in the spot for realtors. Um, obviously that adoption takes a long time. <laughs> um, and especially the, the technology that realtors are running off of is ancient. Um, and I'm sure Richard will talk on and on about that, but 
But yeah, wow. <laughs> the great person. So Charles, yeah, also, I, I'll yeah. tell you just in 10 seconds, there's, there's a resource online that uh, uh, real estate appraisers are now using that lets them calculate net present value of a pre-existing solar array on a house. And they're using that to increase uh, assessed net, value. For resale yeah, value. value. You're talking my language there, Chris. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, I am. That was intentional. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if we can wait two weeks until we continue this conversation. We may have to do a, <laughs> a follow up soon. Um, oh, my gosh. I have so many thoughts spinning. Um, so the realtor thing. And then just one last thought, Russ, did you next door photo? Did they, they use drones too, um, to take some? They right? do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that oh, might. Do, yeah. And then, Chris, I know we had talked because um, when you have those large arrays, infrared um, on drones has been used. There's a couple companies out there monitoring yeah. whole arrays. And they'll use infrared to detect anomalies in temperature because I think if there's uh, there's defects or uh, a short, that panel will heat up and become hotter. So the drone will go up, will take a screen, a, a shot, and detect the panels that potentially have a fault um, with with the drone. So there, I think there's companies out there now. So I, maybe we bring that into the the discussion too because um, for next time. So so anyways, yeah. we we have to leave. It's an hour and ten minutes. Um, <laughs> We got to stop. We got to stop. But we're going to continue this. And Russ, I need to call you for data. Um, and sure, so sure. if everybody could hang on just a second. Um, bye, everybody online. Jason, Richard, we're, we're I'm contacting you. We're going to do this again. So talk All to you right. later. Yep. Thanks, Charles. Yep. Hold on for just a second, guys. All right. And